Alright guys, I don't know when to quit. Obviously. It seems that our stream got cut off. I do apologize to everybody for that. But we're going to try this again. And we're probably going to fail again, but that's okay. We're getting right back into it. Um, blah, blah, blah. Welcome to Nimsy Live. We're talking about geo geocultural intelligence and geopolitical intelligence. I've already given the intro for those of you that are just starting to watch this recording, though. Um, today's topic for Workshop Wednesday is mitigating geocultural risk. Geocultural and geopolitical risk with me. I am your instructor, Tucker Johnson. This is take two because our stream keeps getting inter interrupted and I do apologize for that. But this is a part of NIMSY learning. It's just an excerpt. We do these workshop Wednesdays that are free for the public and hopefully people can get some value out of it. Hello again, Oscar. Nice to see you back. Uh, it was nice to spend five minutes with you earlier. Um, but if you want to hear more about NIMSY Insights and our, our library of learning courses, we've got a whole bunch of workshops out there that are available for, for you guys, for your teams. Reach out to info at NIMSY.com if you want to find out more about this. Now, today we are going to be talking about geo, geoculture, geopolitics, and what we need to be aware of. It's all about awareness today. My goals for you guys today are to gain an appreciation of the importance for considering geopolitical and geocultural risk for your global businesses. I want us to be able to learn to identify the main types of risk and list some examples of each. We're going to be going through examples of each of the types of geopolitical and geocultural risk out there. And lastly, better understand how to provide cultural leadership to your company and to your customers. We're going to break this up into four lessons. It's going to be heavy on the first lesson to take a look at the need for political and cultural awareness. What are we talking about when we talk about geopolitics and geoculture? And I'm watching the stream here to make sure I don't get cut off. It says, it says that it's working, but if it's not, well, we'll deal with that then. So the first part, we're going to take a look at the need for geopolitics and geocultural awareness, and then we're going to go into the four types of intelligence and spend a little bit of time on each of those. We're going to look at market intelligence, language intelligence, political intelligence, and cultural intelligence. And I think we got cut off again. I'm sorry, guys. I want to check this out. Bear with me, folks. Let me know in the comments. If you can still see me. All right. Oscar says it's working fine. So we're going at market intelligence, language intelligence, political intelligence, and cultural intelligence are the three areas that we're going to be looking at today. Without further ado, let's jump right in here. Lesson one. Get rid of that music. Lesson one, the importance of geocultural and geopolitical factors for localization. Like I said, we're going to be spending quite a bit of time here today. This is kind of the, the baseline. We're building, building the foundation for all of these stuff, other stuff that we're going to be going over today before we get into the four types of intelligence. But first of all, what are we even talking about here? So... We're going to be looking at what is what is geopolitical versus geocultural, right? What are, what are, what do we mean when we say these two two different words? And I wish I had uh, one word that could encompass both of them. I don't, so I keep saying geopolitical and geocultural. Oh, we're going to look at the goals for awareness, factors driving risk, because essentially at the end of the day, this is a risk mitigating exercise, building awareness around these factors. We're going to look at why are people offended. A big part of what we need to learn not to do is not to offend our customers. As I say in a lot of my NIMSY Live intros, you know, we need to learn to delight our international customers or, what do I say? I say at least not piss them off too much. And that's kind of the goal here because especially when we're dealing with a bunch of different cultures from around the world, we might be doing something that is offensive 
and not even know it because of the differences in culture. We're going to look at the types of geopolitical and geocultural work. I'll give some examples from work that NIMSI Insights has done for some of our clients. And the four pillars of awareness and a quick introduction to the four types of geopolitical and geocultural advisory. So, to start off, what do we mean by geopolitical versus geocultural here? Geopolitics and culture. These are the two areas where we like to loosely define some of the challenges that we're going to be looking at earlier. Geopolitical, in a sense, is, well, politics, whereas culture is, well, culture is probably the simplest way to say it, but that doesn't help too much. So when we're talking about geopolitics, we're talking about economic factors, we're talking about borders, we're talking about maps. Um, we're talking about wars and conflicts. We're talking about flags. Flags are going to come up over and over again. Borders and flags. Borders and flags. These are two things that come up over and over and over and over again. And if you're out there and you're working in a global organization, just, just avoid flags. Just don't put maps and flags on your website. You're, you're going to have a you're going to have a bad time if you do that for some reasons that we'll see once we get into the presentation here a little bit. Now, culture, on the other hand, is rather than dealing with like the laws and the regulatory environment, culture is more looking about the societal norms. Now, a lot of these things can overlap. Laws tend to reflect culture, and culture can be influenced by the types of laws and regulations that are on the books so to speak. But when we're talking about culture, we're, we're looking at religion. We're looking at language. Language is a big one. And that's going to be super interesting for the folks here because most of the people that watch these workshop Wednesdays, we all work in the language services industry. So what are some of these issues around language, language rights, language justice, language activism, stuff like that? Uh, holidays, celebrations, perceptions, lots of perceptions. What are the perceptions about violence? What are the perceptions about um, sexuality? Um, what are perceptions on gender issues in different markets around the world? So these are all things that fall into the category of geoculture as opposed to geopolitics. Once again, there is some overlap between these. The Venn diagram is, there. there is some overlap between things that would be considered cultural issues versus regulatory or geopolitical issues. So why? Why are we talking about this? You know, as I mentioned when we started, I would hope for us to take away today kind of an understanding that there are issues out there in the world that I need to be aware of. The point of this workshop isn't to teach you what those issues are, or make that value judgment even, but it's to encourage folks out there that there are things happening in the world that affect you, they affect others, they affect your business, they affect your customers. And to be a true localizer, we need to make sure that we're taking these, these different challenges into account as, as we localize content, localize products for an international audience. The goals are really, they can be divided up into short-term goals and long-term goals is how I like to think of it. So in the short term, we want to be aware of geocultural and geopolitical issues so that we can just basically better understand our customers. If we better understand our customers, it's going to allow us to make better decisions that are in the best interest of our customers. We're going to be able to relate to them. We're going to be able to really maintain that control over our brand as as we enter our brand into into foreign markets around the world um brand sentiment is a big deal brand perception there's two, two ways that you can look at a brand it's brand awareness and brand perception brand awareness is ha have they heard of us brand perception is what do they think of us right and if you're not nailing that cultural message in every market around the world, then you're missing out on, on that second part, on the brand perception. They might have heard of you, but maybe they're not too impressed with you because you're not speaking to their actual cultural needs. 
And lastly, in the short term, minimizing your risk in the domains of public sentiment and legal, regulatory, and power dynamics. So in public sentiment, we kind of talked about with the perception, but you also don't want to get on the wrong side of the law. And there are case studies out there with company executives actually you know, going to jail going to jail because they were not aware of certain things, you know, putting, putting the wrong map or the wrong borders in the wrong place or the wrong flags on the websites. Um, there are governments out there that actually very much take this seriously and will punish the offenders. I'm pretty unforgiving about it. So that's the short term. The longer term, it's essentially this awareness is an ongoing exercise. I like to say it's, it's it's changing your lifestyle to be more aware of the issues on an ongoing basis of this changing world. The world is changing. The world always has been changing. Uh, I would argue that especially with the rise of social media and the internet access to information, the world, the rate at which the world is changing continues to accelerate. So how do we stay ahead of that? Well, it's an ongoing exercise. It's not a diet. It's a lifestyle change, and that's the that's how I how I draw the difference. You can go on a diet to lose some weight really quick, but it's not changing the way that you live. It's not changing the way that you eat, so it's not going to be great for the long term. For the long term, we need a lifestyle change in the way that we approach a lot of these topics, and also to deeply understand emerging customer trends. So, what do I mean by this? <sighs> customer sentiment, behavior, preference, it's intimately linked to language, culture, and politics. These three things, language, culture, and politics. The words that we use can affect culture, and the culture can affect politics. And that all comes back to the work that we do in the language services industry, working directly with language. Words have power, so we need to be careful about the words that we use. Looking at some of the factors that drive driving political risk, we're seeing increasing globalization. That's not going to stop. Globalization is here to stay, whether we like it or not. We can talk about you know, some of the trends that are happening in the global markets right now, but I think we can all agree that overall globalization is going to continue. Increasing cultural sensitivity, tribalism, defensive, along with globalization, I should say. And globalization is a driver of a lot of these different things. But along with globalization, we see an increase in cultural sensitivity, increase in tribalism and defensiveness. Um, nationalism is another word that's used to describe this phenomenon. Um, an increasing focus on representation as the world becomes more... I don't want to say homogenous, but as the world becomes more universal, then individual cultures are fighting harder or have to fight harder in order to preserve their cultures. And this applies to language as well. So you could use English as, as the scapegoat in this. As more and more people use English on the global market space as a, a, the lingua franca, the language of business, or so to speak, and uh, we can argue about whether that's actually, actually true or not. Um, but as that happens, we're seeing increased defensiveness of local languages, and they don't want their languages to go extinct, essentially, and very real concerns around that as well. An increased focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, out there is driving a lot of perception, a lot of cultural shifts around the world. What those cultural shifts look like varies in every culture. Um, what, you know, the approach to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the U.S., for example, might not look exactly the same as the, the approach in Italy, as the approach in Japan for example, but it is still something that we need to be aware of. And of course, increased tensions in international relations between governments. I mean, we've seen, we've seen this in, in the last year with uh, the war, essentially, with what's happening over in Ukraine, with, between Ukraine and Russia, right now with the invasion of Ukraine. So lots going on out there, oh, and rise of woke culture. This is kind of a catch-all phrase. Um, I'm going to let you define for yourself what woke culture is. 
Uh, you can Google that and go down that rabbit hole if you want, but not the purpose of this conversation today to define woke culture, just simply to bring attention to it. Woke culture is, well, and here I'm going to try to define it. Woke culture is, I would say, an increased focus on social justice. What is social justice, right? An increased focus on um, advocacy, social justice representation for traditionally marginalized groups of of communities and individuals around the world. And that's going to be my attempt at at defining woke culture there. So I mentioned that the reason we want to be aware of this is because we don't want to offend our customers. We don't want to offend our employees. We don't want to offend our, our stakeholders. And when we start stepping into the cultural realm, we run the risk of offending people. Indeed, if you're doing anything that's not boring, you run the risk of offending people. And I'm not saying intentionally, but I'm saying unintentionally. And this can have, this can have negative consequences for, for your brand in the, on the international stage, let's just say. And with the, with the rise of the internet and globalization, if to offend a group, um, to offend one market, that might actually spill over into other markets now. Markets aren't in silos anymore. They're talking to each other. So if you um, do something unintentionally that's unintentionally insensitive to a marginalized group, let's just say in Spain, then they're going to hear about it in France, and the papers are going to be writing about it in Germany. It's going to get out there. So it makes sense to take a look at why are people offended. And once again, this is just an awareness thing so that we can try to empathize with folks and not get to that point where, where we're being insensitive. So once again, increasing globalization, increasing cultural sensitivity. Oh, these are all the same. I, I need to update this slide. These are all the same. A lot of the same things that we saw on the previous slide. Um, but this last point here, the internet and social media make it easier than ever to be offended customers to da and, and for offended customers to damage your reputation. So as we've already kind of discussed, you know, what are the reasons that people, people can get offended by a brand? It's another important component of that is how easy is it for them to share that information, right? Um, if people are offended, people like talking about being offended online. They do. So we need to be aware of that. It is a reason why we need to be aware of these geocultural and geopolitical issues. Moving on, because those are difficult slides to talk about, uh, the types of geopolitical and geocultural work. So I think so far what I've tried to do is kind of outline why do we need, what is geocultural awareness? What is geopolitical awareness? Why do we need to be aware of this? Like, and I always say, like, to put it simply is not to offend people. We don't want to be insensitive. We don't want to want to offend people. That, I don't think anyone ever sets out to do that. That's not the goal. So having made the case for why we need to be aware of this, what are we talking about when we're talking about geocultural and geopolitical work? Well, uh, or what can brands do to make sure that they're not doing this? Well, research out there. And this isn't you know just a plug for Nim Nimsy Insights. It's a research company, and I'm not trying to just say um, work with Nimsy. There's plenty of other consultants out there. And in fact, if you have a priority market out there that you really want to focus on, I would recommend with going with someone local. You don't need to go with one of the big research companies that you guys have all heard of before. An individual consultant can do just fine. In that area, someone who really knows the the needs and the concerns of the the local markets and the local communities there. So all sorts of types of research, you got, um, market reports, geocultural training, lots of training out there. I would say a little self-serving comment here. Not all training is created equally. Not everybody expressing to be an expert in this area really has a lot of value to add. So make sure that you're vetting any trainers or consultants that you bring on board. Uh, culturalization reviews are another um, popular way to address this issue. So that would be like 
bringing in a consultant, bringing in an expert, bringing, we've done this before here at MZ Insights where we'll go in and we'll do a culturalization review of a product, of a marketing message, just to make sure is this message, is this product going to fit well into the markets that we're targeting and provide feedback on that. Uh, sensitive political term, sensitive terminology or politically problematic terminology database review is so think of this as like scrubbing your translation memories, scrubbing scrubbing your glossaries, making sure that there's not any terms in there that are potentially offensive. Uh, Bob Drake, who I mentioned, I think before we had to start this stream over again, he's done a lot of work in this area. Um, for, for pretty big clients, identifying potentially offensive terms to create databases so that content can be run through those databases and scanned for potential terms. Those terms can be flagged before they are published and reviewed by a human person. Um, and region-specific on-site consulting. Like I said, don't be afraid to get someone local. They really know their stuff. Some of the stuff that we've worked on here at MZ Insights, uh, flags, Looking at you know interesting language pairs like Spanish for the U.S. market, that's a, that's a really interesting subject, and there's a lot to be said on that um, because Spanish is there's a lot of different types of Spanish here in the U.S. market. So what's the best approach if you're trying to target Spanish speakers here in the U.S. market? Um, Olympics cause Olympics were a great excuse to do a lot of geo cultural research out there because just by the very nature of what's happening, what, what happens at the Olympics, all these cultures coming together and melding into to one event, there's the potential for disasters to happen there. So yeah, some of the research that we've done. The four pillars that I want to go over is, and these are kind of the four bases that you want to hit, the four things that are affected by, by these types of Matters are content, style, service, and your team. So is your content relevant? Is it accurate? Is it appropriate to the local audiences? What is your style? Does your style fall flat in different markets? Different cultures have different perceptions on formality, for example. English doesn't even have different tenses for formal versus informal. And uh, I... I I can speak for Americans. I think Americans kind of like to have this really modern, fun vibe style in our writing. And that doesn't translate well over into some other cultures that, that have a more formal approach to things. In regards to service, deadlines, you know, this is the way that I describe this, deadlines do not mean the same thing across cultures. The, the perception and the approach to timeliness, for example, is can look very different across different cultures. Some cultures uh, place a lot of priority on punctuality, and other culture other cultures don't. They prioritize other things, which is fine. But these are things that we want to be aware of. Communication. What is communication? This kind of goes back into the style and the formality, right? How formal do I need to be when communicating? Um, it's rare these days that you refer. I should say, I should use myself. It's rare these days that I refer to someone as Mr. or Mrs. or Miss. It's just because that would be, it's seen as kind of weird. In a courtroom setting, that makes perfect sense, you know, to refer to someone as Mr. or Mrs. Um, you refer to your doctor as doctor so-and-so. But here in America, um, largely we're on a first-name basis with people. There's not that power distance that is prevalent in, in other cultures. So something to take into effect in regards to service. And lastly, the team. The This is not just an outward-looking exercise when we're analyzing different cultures and building our awareness of different cultures. We also need to look internally at our team and see, are, are is my team properly, properly trained on how to deal with different cultures? What is the culture of my team? And do, how, how can I be more responsive and sensitive to the culture of my team internally, not just to my customers? Now, we're starting to look at the, 
the four types of intelligence that we're going to go over in part two in the second half of this presentation. We've got market intelligence, political intelligence, cultural intelligence, and language intelligence. And the, what I want you to take away from this is awareness. I probably said the word awareness 20 times in here because this is what it's about. Uh, studying, researching, these, you know, market intelligence, political intelligence, cultural intelligence, language intelligence, it's an ongoing process. And it's an ongoing process to build and maintain awareness. You're never done. You're never done with this. This is why I have it as a circle here. It's an ongoing process. And the second point I'd like to make is not everything's going to fit cleanly into one of these categories. There is certainly overlap. Now, before we go in and do a little bit more of a deep dive into what these different types of intelligence mean, I want to take a look at some topics to watch. Because I'm telling you, you need to build awareness of this. And I, I'm hoping I, I, I made a case earlier on why it's important for you to be aware of cultural issues and geopolitical issues around the world. Um, so if, I, if, I, if I've got you to come along with me this far then I owe it to you to say, well, how do you do that? How do you build awareness on an on? How do I change my lifestyle, as you say? And the easiest way to do this is by looking at the type of news that you consume and the sources that you consume it from, the topics that you're aware of. And in this day and age, if you consume your news on an app like, like I do, like most people do, you can actually go into that app and put keywords in on topics that you'd like to track. So I'm going to give you some topics that make a lot of sense to track. If you're if you're starting down this journey of maintaining awareness of of what's going on in the world, here's some topics to enter. Here's some good keywords to put into your Google search alerts. Uh-oh. I think I lost you guys. Oh, I didn't. Are you still with me? Nice. All right, we're hanging in there. The the computer, I really don't want to have to buy a new computer, but I'm going to have to if these streams keep getting interrupted. So I think we're still good. Let me... Let me check over on LinkedIn if you're still with me. Yeah, looks like it. All right. So some topics to watch. Uh, representation, inclusion. Thank you, Oscar. Representation, inclusion and access, gender and language, maps and borders, religious beliefs, perceptions of racism. So race, gender, all of these hot topics. Activism, activists, holidays. International events, like we talked about the Olympics before. Changing of official names of monuments. This is always a fun one, you know, with um, what more information coming to light and awareness being built just in the general public these days. We're realizing as a society there's a lot of monuments, statues, mountains, whatever it is, named after some people that maybe weren't the great people. Maybe you weren't great people and don't deserve to be celebrated. So you can kind of it, – it's interesting to watch when governments or municipalities decide to change names of things because there's always a story behind that. Uh, perceptions regarding LGBTQ plus uh, countries with historical or current tensions like China. China is a good one to watch. Russia is a good one to watch right now too. But China is a good one to watch. Um, regime changes, censorship. Currency changes, Bitcoin, as watching how governments and how markets respond to Bitcoin has has been super interesting to watch. I'll bring the list back up on here for you. Um, indigenous people, indigenous people, the concerns of indigenous peoples. And it's a historically marginalized group or groups of people that it makes sense to watch out there. Current memes. Memes are a great thing to watch because memes kind of tell you where out there. Memes, comedy, 
jokes, the jokes that people are making, whether they are appropriate jokes or not appropriate jokes, especially watch the inappropriate jokes because watching those and people's reactions to those are going to tell you kind of where the cultural perception is. And flags. I've mentioned flags before. I'll mention flags again. Flags can be problematic. Just stay away from flags out there. Now, if you don't want to watch these topics, or that seems like too long of a list, here are some companies to watch. I love learning from watching other people make mistakes, watching other organizations make some mistakes. And the companies on this list here, we got Google, Facebook, Amazon, Disney, Twitter, uh, video game companies, McDonald's, Starbucks, TikTok. Just by the nature of how big they are out there is they're, when they mess up, they mess up in a really big way and a pretty well-publicized way, which makes it really interesting to, to learn from them, essentially. I have Unicode Consortium on here, too. Who's the Unicode Consortium? They are the folks. They are the secret society that um, – they're not secret society. But they're, they're the folks that um, – they do a lot of things. But they also approve new emojis. Right? So anytime a new emoji is added – and that's always a fun thing to watch. Every year when they come out with the, the new emojis, to see what emojis are approved by the Unicorn Consortium and why – there's, it, it speaks to a lot of um, representation, inclusion, diversity out there. I do believe the Unicode Consortium recently stopped accepting proposals for flags, though. So they've taken my advice. Stay away from flags. Flags can be problematic in this day and age. All righty. So wrapping this up here, I think we've gotten through part one. We're still streaming. We haven't shut down yet. Some things to consider, just to quickly review here. Geopolitics deals with government and geoculture, deals with public perceptions and societal norms. These two often overlap, but I find it useful to break them down into these two different categories, geopolitics and geoculture. Awareness is the goal. Awareness allows us to understand our customers and our markets, stay ahead of shifting norms, and understand emerging customer trends. It's all about our customers, customer-centric, being aware of what's important to our customers, regardless of what market, what culture they're in. There are many factors contributing to global risk, and these are constantly changing. People, in other words, customers, can get offended for many reasons. The risk can be mitigated through awareness. Everybody together, awareness. Awareness can mean market awareness, language awareness, political awareness, and cultural awareness, though not all factors click fit cleanly into one of these three models. So keeping an eye on key topics will allow us to maintain awareness over time. You can also learn much from observing the actions and mistakes of prominent global companies. It's like what we talked about earlier, you know, follow Facebook, see what Netflix is doing, see what Disney is doing. Disney's a great one to watch. I don't think that was on my, oh, it was on my list. But um, Disney is a great company to watch as they experiment in the public space with um, culture because they, they what they do is they they produce entertainment. Entertainment is inextricably linked to culture. So with increasing globalization, it's becoming harder and harder for Disney to publish content that's relevant and appropriate for all markets around the world rather than just their home market. So with that, let's get into it here. I want to look at some examples. Lesson two, we're going to look at market intelligence. Once again, we're going to be going through the four different types of intelligence. Those are market intelligence, political intelligence, cultural intelligence, and language intelligence. So getting right into it, we'll start with market intelligence. And for each of these, we're going to break it down. It's, you're going to see a, a pattern here after a while. We're going to define it. We're going to look at some key components of it, and then we're going to look at some case studies and examples. We're also going to look at some practical questions to ask yourself about each of these things and kind of do some introspection exercises for each of the four types of intelligence. So with market intelligence, let's talk about geography, demographics, and economic conditions. Geography. 
These are the things, things that you want to know about the market. Right. So what are their natural resources? Who are their neighbors? What is their relationship with those neighbors? What are the people like in those markets? What languages do they speak? What gods do they pray to? What is their median age? Are there a lot of immigrants there? Is it a homogenous culture or is it really diverse? What are the economic conditions? Is there a lot of competition there? Is there a lot of government regulation? On business, what are the government regulations? How do people buy products? Right. What currencies do they use? What technologies do they use? Who do they trade with? Do they export? What do they export? What do they import? These are the, and this is, we start with market intelligence because this is typically what people think of when they think of market research, right? Getting a market report with just kind of baseline information here a lot of this this has been done right you don't need to hire a company like nimsy insights to get a baseline of market intelligence there's great resources out there the cia actually central intelligence agency publishes free it's out there uh the cia world fact book i think is what it's called and it covers a lot of these these things you can find a lot of information that's just very high level information available in the markets um, without having to bring in an external consultant, which is kind of nice. Just checking my stream here. All right. So my internet keeps dropping. Now, you would want to bring in an external consultant if you wanted to go a little bit deeper because having a nice background, a nice foundation to understand the market is great. But remember, what we really care about is understanding our specific customers. And I don't sell to the same people that you sell to, right? So getting that extra level of, yeah, but what are my customers? You know, what do males between the age of 25 and 35 think, you know, living in the southwest regions of this market? What do they think? You know, that's where you might want to bring in the big guns and do some specific market research in that area. Alrighty. And moving on to some questions to ask. Sorry, and sorry if I feel if I sound like I'm off today, it's because I'm watching this stream like a hawk to make sure. Last time I did this, this is take two. Last time I did this, it was um I was literally talking to myself for an hour. The stream stopped, but I didn't. So I'm trying to avoid that situation today. Well, folks, I think I got cut off. I'm sorry. We tried. We tried. So I'm going to call it a day. Thank you for joining me. For those of you that made it through the first section, stay tuned. We'll get the second section out there at some point. Until then, you have a great day. Ciao.